Hello everybody. I hope that you are doing well today and that you are safe from Hurricane Ian. We have some remnants of Ian uh, where I'm at right now filming, so you might hear some rain sounds. As promised, I'm going to be walking you through a Scientific American, this uh, particular, it's volume 327, number three, and this particular um, issue uh, talks a lot about black holes. Now this says black holes mystery solved. Uh, that's not necessarily true. It's just kind of a selling point for this magazine. Uh, there are some theories presented, some old and some new, that could potentially one day fix the paradox uh, with, with black holes that I'll, that I'll tell you about, uh, but it doesn't by any means actually solve them. And just a disclosure, I am not an expert on any of this uh, information, so um, just keep that in mind. Also, the general consensus was that I um, can do what I want with my nails, but that perhaps some of the um, science videos, it is distracting, so I wore show the nails today, no sparkles. Um, I, uh, I agree, I think that I'm just going to focus on the science today and hope that it's relaxing for you all. So here we have the table of contents and some advertisements. It's a lot of information, so I'm going to try to be as concise as possible. Um, and I'm not going to read like notes from the editor or letters from subscribers. So here's some interesting information right off the bat. This talks about healthcare starts at school. School-based clinics can reach kids who lack access. It's kind of along the same lines as kids who um, or not at school, uh, they, like during COVID, there was a, a crisis with kids not having access to food. For some children, the school is the only place where they can get that access to um, food and it's healthcare. So trying to make that even more accessible to certain areas where children don't have access to healthcare and also talks about children's mental health. Um, young people in the U.S. are experiencing a mental health crisis. A higher number um, than ever before have basically said that they are having feelings of anxiety and distress. And so this talks about the need to teach children coping skills for those things, which I totally agree with. Um, now here's some like um, cutting edge advancements in science. This one talks about uh, an eye test that can help diagnose Alzheimer's disease. Um, the current means for detecting Alzheimer's is a PET, like brain imaging, and then CSF. And these are not readily available, they're expensive and invasive, so scientists have found a way to possibly look at the retina for clues to Alzheimer's because the retina is actually formed in the embryo by a piece of the brain. Um, I don't think it's very connected and that an amyloid, which is the protein that is associated with Alzheimer's, can build up on the retina. Um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but it could be promising for detecting. I'm so sorry, that's the ice maker. Um, and the fridge sounds, which I, I had a, I actually took down a video one time because I got so many complaints about the fridge sounds. Um, so I'm not, I'm not gonna do that this time, but I, I hope it's not too bothersome. Okay, so this one basically talks about cnidarians, which are jellyfish, sea anemones, and corals. Um, they sting with tiny pressurized capsules, fire poisonous darts, and scientists are figuring out how they are able to do that using a slingshot type mechanism to propel their stinger, um, hoping to potentially utilize that for medical systems or therapeutics. So. A lot of times scientists look to nature for clues on how to um, do certain things that could they, they, they pull from nature for medicine and therapies. 
which is pretty cool. So quantum mutants, this looks basically at the um, DNA double helix, the double strands that are held together with um, protein, the rungs together, um, saying that these tiny quantum effects that allow the protein on one strand to tunnel and hook up to an incorrect um, base on the other, they normally happen so quickly and then they jump back, but they happen so frequently that even though it's quick, it could actually cause more DNA mutations than had been previously thought. This um, article, I'll call it an article, <laughs> talks about um, a cave fish who uh, basically is blind and colorless, so scientists were able to study their genome and found that there was a deleted DNA segment in one of their genes that um, makes the fish unable to metabolize tyrosine, which is used for pigment. Pigment instead, um, the tyrosine is used for energy. So they live in a very um, energy-starved environment, energy-deprived situation. So this actually has enabled them to survive there, which is pretty cool. This one got checked. They talk about um, parasites and parasites between species like elephants and donkeys or cattle and any domestic animal with wild animals like recently 90% it was found that 90% of camels had parasites so deworming um, um, will help um, giraffes that are endangered now um, and livestock so it's just talking about ways to help farmers and people in these areas manage parasites so here's another example of scientists pulling from nature to create something for medicine um, this is a chip with artificial cilia, which, as you know, cilia are found on microscopic um, things like bacteria and protists, and they move um, in a very particular way. And so implementing that on a small chip could enable scientists to more accurately study very small um, uh, blood, urine, and other fluids. More, more smaller samples of them more efficiently. Quick hits. We've got some research in Greenland. Um, researchers found an isolated polar bear population that has adapted to uh, long-term access to sea ice without long-term access to sea ice, my apologies, by hunting from fallen chunks of glaciers, which obviously would benefit them if the sea ice dwindles. Let's see, Australia, the world's largest known organism is a 77 square mile seagrass bed. Uh, Brazil, a tiny toad species in her ears are too small to work as internal gyroscopes leading to terrible jumping skills. Okay, that's kind of funny. <laughs> they somersault through the air and land on their backs. I'm not going to read all of those. This um, volume is actually accessible, I believe, online if you have a subscription. Or um, it was sold in September, so I'm not sure if you could still get your hands on a copy. So now we have an article about sleeping brains. Um, there are distinctive bursts of sleeping brain activity known as sleep spindles, and it is found that after you learn an activity or work through and learn anything, um, if you go to sleep, the your your um, 
sleep spindles are associated with strengthening recently formed memories to help you fortify what you've learned. So whatever you learned in that particular area of your brain, your sleep spindles, if they are bigger, um, you are more likely to remember things. So that's interesting. Um, how the brain stores memories and all of that is pretty fascinating. Fern, tree of life. Um, ferns are pretty fascinating. They are more closely related to seeding plants but they reproduce like mushrooms or fungi by releasing spores and um, this basically talks about how their genome once doubled in size which happens in plants sometimes but instead of going back to regular size and it kept the double genome and it has six billion base DNA base pairs we have three billion as humans so that's a pretty big genome all right, so icy resonance. This talks about using ice vibrations to pick up seismic clues from volcanoes and earthquakes, as opposed to just their standard um, seismologist tools. And it's actually much more accurate, the small vibrations in ice some science and images. So this is some cool images. These are some cool images of minerals. Uh, they are geologic time capsules of the environments in which they form. They are really cool. I, um, I'm one of those people that likes <laughs> collecting crystals and rocks. I find that fascinating. And this basically just talks about how pyrite, calcite, opalized ammonite, and malachite form. Uh, I apologize if I skip something that you really want to hear about, but when I say there's a lot of information in here, there's a lot of information. So um, I will just, if you have questions or want to know about something I skipped, um, feel free to ask comments. Okay. And we have the science of health, the secrets of thirst. And I've heard this before. They say to have eight, eight ounce glasses of water, but that's, um, how much do you actually need? It's kind of a ubiquitous recommendation because um, pretty much any fluid that we take in counts towards that and a lot of it actually comes from our food. So technically um, it really just depends on your level of activity, the amount of heat in your environment, and things like that. So your body really has a great thirst mechanism and um, will tell you when you need to drink. So this is just a sponsored scientist and feature. Um, I think it's, they do one in a lot of their issues. This is neurologist Christopher Walsh and he discovered that genes direct cerebral cortex development and this is about a particular mutation um, in a family where early brain development frequently went awry and it was leading to a lot of epilepsy and it showed that during the development the um, neurons only traveled halfway where they needed to go so um, they had double the corte cortex neurons um, in the mutated brain. They stalled. And so you can see where they stalled here. This is bigger and shaped differently than a normal one where they migrated, the neurons migrated properly to the outer edge. So, wow, y'all, here we are, the black holes. Um, this is a bit um, uh, 
of a special because it actually has three articles devoted to it. Maybe even four. My apologies. I think there's actually four. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly explain what's, what's in this information and I'm going to put the pen down for this, this portion. Let me know if you liked that, um, the utilization of the pen as opposed to just pointing. To many people, black holes evoke a mysterious darkness threatening to swallow you up. To scientists, they have sometimes seemed like the mystery that might swallow physics. They awkwardly bridge the theories of quantum mechanics and general relativity, exposing deep weaknesses in our understandings of nature. But recent theoretical and observational advances have helped illuminate these shadowy objects for profound implications. So they've, um, observational advancements have helped illuminate them, but it certainly hasn't solved anything in my opinion. Paradox resolve. So what is the black hole paradox or the information paradox related to black holes? How competing teams of researchers made the first breakthroughs and one of the deepest mysteries in physics. That's true, they are, they are breakthroughs. Okay, so um, basically this talks about boiling and unboiling an egg, which actually can be done. Um, in physics, everything is reversible. Anything in the physical world can run both ways, except for black holes, um, which are, if you don't know, basically massive stars that collapse under their own weight. The gravity is so intense that, and without limit, that if you jump in, there's no going back. So anything that gets sucked into a black hole is, it's in there. <laughs> um, this irreversibility was first described in the 50s and uh, Einstein's theory of relativity fit really well with it. Um, However, it left out quantum mechanics, and so then in the 1970s, along came Hawking, Stephen Hawking, and he described something called the information paradox, and that basically slight amounts of radiation actually come out of black holes, and as the energy bleeds away, past the point of no return, the black hole disappears and with it, it, the information disappears. But as we know, information in physics doesn't actually disappear. So where does it go? This is the information paradox. Physical information cannot be destroyed. Um, this is actually the heftiest article here. This is a lot of background and then we get into, sorry, more, um, it just goes into more detail. So the first thing um, that helped solve this is the concept of entanglement, which actually Stephen Hawking's grad student really kind of worked on pioneering that. And that basically means um, this is a big thing in quantum mechanics. And it basically means that there are pairs of particles. And so one particle is trapped in the black hole and the other one escapes in the form of radiation. And so that is entanglement. Um, so whatever happens to the particle inside the black hole affects the particle on the outside and vice versa. And the edge of a black hole is called the event horizon and that is where the particles become separated and you see the radiation and it's actually called Hawking radiation. So first there's entanglement. So that was the first um, breakthrough um, theory and this goes into more detail about that and it takes it to a new level because it talks about um, how when the black hole is destroyed the particle on the outside is affected and it's left with a negative charge and or, or any charge 
and it would build up something called a firewall. So it would actually create a firewall paradox and um, which would stop space-time completely and nothing would, else would be able to enter the black hole. So that's another paradox. One way to explain where the information in a black hole goes and how it prevents a firewall is wormholes. So as you saw, wormholes. And wormholes are basically um, just a way, they're bridges in space-time that connect to uh, distant spots through a shortcut. For half a century, physicists have agonized over the question of what happens to the information that falls into a black hole. If, as theory predicts, black holes destroy information about everything that has ever fallen in, then our theories of nature are in depth in deep foundational trouble. Scientists have made breakthroughs. Um, black holes do evaporate, okay? Just like a puddle of water, okay? Quantum physics theorizes that empty space isn't actually empty. So here are the entangled particles. Here's one going in and one escaping, and that's the escaping radiation. This negative energy shrivels the black hole down to nothing. Um, but if, but if black holes can be destroyed, then the information about what fell into them also is destroyed. Unless it travels through a wormhole, the inside of a black hole could be connected to the inside of another black hole. So as one black hole evaporates, the information instead of disappearing just is wormholed to another black hole. So. I don't know a lot about wormholes. Um, that's basically all I, all I can tell you. Um, also, something to note in quantum mechanics and quantum physics, a particle doesn't simply travel along one path. It bounces all over. They um, say it's everywhere all at once. And also in chemistry, there is a kind of some new theories about how the um, electrons and protons and such behave inside of the atom as well. Um, electrons have particular shells they're in, but they can be in any part of that shell at any time. So um, if wormholes are at the center of black holes, information pulled within them may not actually be destroyed. Okay. This is the firewall paradox. and talks about entering the black hole. Okay, so this talks about the next concept or the next um, theory that scientists have used to explain um, what happens to the information in black holes. And the Tale of Two Horizons, you might, if you are interested in space, you might have heard of this, that space might technically actually be 2D, two-dimensional. So that's what this article is about. Where did the universe come from? Where is it headed? Answering these questions requires that we understand physics on two vastly different scales, the cosmological, referring to galaxy superclusters, the cosmos as a whole, and the quantum, or the counterintuitive world of atoms and nuclei. So, um, if you look at black holes, entropy, um, their descend, de, um, their, their chaos formula, basically the more volume a black hole has does not affect the entropy but the area that it takes up does affect the entropy. So scientists are saying that, some scientists, excuse me, are saying that this is indicative of the black hole actually being two-dimensional since the area it takes up is more important than the volume. If you look at gas 
in a closed container, its entropy relies heavily on volume, not on area, two-dimensional area. Another thing is that if you look at space as two-dimensional, it actually enables the mathematics of relativity and quantum mechanics to fit together, which scientists have been trying to put together for a long time. They do not cooperate. And this talks about how maybe the information to black holes is not lost, um, even as the black hole disappears, because it left a two-dimensional imprint beyond the event horizon. And this article takes a little further because it talks about how um, our universe has an event horizon. Okay, so with a black hole, when you're looking in at the event horizon and the 2D black hole, and there's a point of singularity in a black hole, meaning the one place where time stops and it's, it becomes irreversible. Nothing. And you're looking in and it's condensing into singularity past the event horizon. The boundary where light becomes trapped in a spherical event horizon around the center of the black hole. If you look at our cosmological event horizon, you're looking at it from inside as opposed to outside looking in. And our universe, instead of condensing, is actually um, accelerating at a very rapid pace. And so how they behave is, is a lot different, but there is a point of which we cannot see, and scientists believe it's about 16 billion light years away. Where we can't see past that, that's the event horizon. And they're trying to use black hole mathematics for um, event horizons with black holes to study cosmic event horizons, but they haven't matched up as of yet um, because our universe is not contracting like black holes. So this is like very much a theory and not proven. None of this is, is proven, honestly, um, but it is interesting, right? The holographic principle, I'm gonna read this to you and then I have, I have to get through much more <laughs> as I can very quickly because I'm worried my phone's gonna cut off. An important concept for understanding black holes is the holographic principle. The principle states that a quantum theory of gravity can, that can describe black holes should be formulated in two dimensions, like the surface of their spherical, spherical event horizon. Not three, like the volume inside. The reason has to do with black hole's entropy, which is a measure of the amount of stuff you can stick inside of it. The entropy depends on the area of the black hole, not the volume. An event horizon can be thought of as surrounding a spherical volume. It can also be described in terms of surface area. If the surface area is known, the total en entropy of the black hole can be calculated. Okay. And then we talk about the black hole in our Milky Way, Sagittarius A. The first picture of black hole was actually M87, which was further away and moved very slowly, so slowly it was difficult, it was so huge that it was difficult to, it took hours to find any movement at a time. And Sagittarius A is more than 1,000 times less massive, its appearance changes 1,000 times faster than ME7. It moves in tighter, quicker orbits around the black hole. Matter moves in tighter, quicker orbits around the black hole. So black hole is actually um, the area around them, space-time changes. That is the theory of relativity. Um, they warp uh, the gravity and space-time around them until you get to the event horizon. The Milky Way's central supermassive black hole is roughly 27,000 light years away in a dense, chaotic region known as the galactic center. And 
there's a lot of activity there as opposed to where we are and we don't have nearly as many stars so the gravity around it is very much pulling things towards it um, it's very condensed there that doesn't mean it's gonna suck us and let me specify that it is far enough away that it is not affecting us okay and this talks about how it was difficult to get a clear picture of it from all the different spots on the planet at the same time when it was up above Earth's horizon. So I hope I did okay explaining that for you all. I am briefly going to mention some of these other articles. Um, Saving Snakes is a, an article about a person who started a social media site and the social media site um, has enabled Texas residents in loca different localities to post pictures of snakes and for experts to tell them whether they are venomous or harmless so that less snakes are being killed because they're being mis um, mistaken as venomous snakes. One thing to note um, please do not ever call a snake poisonous. Poison is in reference to ingesting something. If an animal um, has venom and can inf inflict it into you, then um, it is venom. The spider is venomous, the snake is venomous. So here is a diamondback water snake. He's not venomous. He gets mistaken as a cottonmouth in Texas. Um, which is right here. There's the venomous one. He's got pits. It's a, like a pit viper. They, a lot of venomous snakes have, not all, but a lot have um, pits. And then here's a western rat snake that can get really, really large, but he's harmless. And so by becoming more familiar with snakes, People are um, less afraid and more aware of the benefits of leaving the good snakes. And then if there is a venomous snake, the um, experts actually will dispatch, dispatch someone to come get them. Forecasting atmospheric rivers. Knowing when torrents of rain will strike. An atmospheric river is... Um, a huge pressure system on the west coast that basically causes tremendous amounts of rain. It is actually responsible for a lot of mudslides and so this is just looking at um, coming up with a better intensity scale and uh, notification to the public. It also would enable um, local municipalities to um, be prepared for keeping certain reservoirs open or shut to collect the water during dry times um, or open it and let some of it out if it's going to be like a category five. So it looks at the maximum water vapor and the um, duration and so the more vapor and the longer it would be a very hazardous um, atmospheric river. I was eating breakfast on a Monday morning at Sears Fine Food. ARs are essentially rivers of water vapor in the sky that are pushed along by strong, low altitude winds, sometimes at hurricane speed. They were defined in the early 2010s. Here's a picture of one. River in the sky, strong winds create heavy flow of concentrated vapor. And then this looks at the vapor quantity and the amount of movement. So the duration as it sits over a particular area, obviously it's going to drench, drench more. And sometimes it can be beneficial and sometimes it can be catastrophic. Um, 
the recent Big Sur landslides, mudslides were associated with an atmospheric river. So, with better preparedness, safety, and utility officials can lessen the risk that atmospheric rivers pose and maximize water storage. So, last but not least, AI writes about itself, artificial intelligence. Somebody wrote an algorithm to have um, artificial intelligence write a scientific publication about itself. So this discusses basically what that means for being published, who's the author, if AI can write um, research papers using uh, algorithms, then how do we know that when scientists publish in the future that these AI um, algorithms uh, programmed into AI were not responsible for some of that research and the ethics associated with AI. There's always a question of ethics when it comes to, to AI in all, all areas of it. Um, it's a very short article, very brief. There are some issues of Scientific American that have a lot of more information about artificial intelligence. This one focused on black holes. I hope you guys liked this. Um, I, I hope if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me. Like I said, I'm not an expert. Um, I do enjoy learning about space and quantum mechanics and all of that, but um, I really just am scratching the surface, and so uh, please take it easy on me. And I hope that you were able to relax and that everybody has a 